as I've been reflecting a lot lately, uh, in the old days, like February, <laughs> you know, a year ago, February, uh, we were propped up by all kinds of things that we just took for granted. We didn't, didn't even think about it. Forms of stress relief, forms of, you know, just entertaining ourselves, conveniences of various kinds, being able to casually walk into the supermarket at the last minute and grab something and not wonder, you know, who you were standing next to. So much of that has fallen away. So much of that has fallen away, uh, large and small. And what's been added, of course, are stresses about money, stresses about health, interpersonal issues, and so forth. So we're really faced with what is inside us already. What have we grown inside ourselves? Psychological resources, inclinations, wholesome qualities inside ourselves. This is a reckoning. We are being all tested, uh, large and small, at all levels. And it's an opportunity to recognize the good in ourselves and to realize that, yes, we need to up our game a little bit. We can't afford to get into these little bickering things with other people like we used to. We can't afford to be a little sloppy with our personal health practices. We, we can't afford to indulge the kind of ruminations and resentments and worries we used to. We just can't afford it anymore. We need to raise our game. And in the process of that, uh, to quote, the teachings of the Buddha from the Pali Canon coming to us from 2,500 years ago, we can find gladness in our goodness. We can appreciate and take refuge in, not in some vain, narcissistic, self-congratulatory way, but in a way that respects ourselves, much as we would find gladness in the goodness that we see in another person, genuinely. Um, we can uh, appreciate our own goodness, our own efforts, our own large heartedness, the vastness inherently of our own consciousness, like the sky. Uh, we can appreciate our sincere efforts, you know, our generosity to our others. And this is a time that we can, we can do that. And um, we are earning that recognition of our own goodness. And as we recognize it, it's calming, it's soothing, and it's reassuring. So I'd like to talk tonight about worrying. Does anybody worry? Anybody worry about anything ever? I don't know, you know, me, you, we all worry a little bit at least, right? We worry, maybe you worry that you're not worried enough. Like, what am I missing? Because I'm too unworried, I'm too peaceful. I've been meditating too much. I'm losing sight of the tigers in the bushes that might be about to pounce, right? So. I'm thinking of uh, something close to what the Dalai Lama said once. He said about worry, essentially. He said, well, if I worry about something and it doesn't happen, there was no need to worry about it. So I don't worry about it. And if it does happen, I'll deal with it as best I can. I'll do the best I can with it. And I don't worry about it because I know I'm just doing the best I can. And what will be will be. And I'm doing the best I can. Right. I, you know, to add something he didn't say, but it's true. He has a compassionate heart. We have compassionate hearts. We can have compassion for the things that we're not able to stop or create, even while we do the best we can. But still, if you know you're doing the best you can, you kind of let go of worrying because you're just doing the best you can. So either way, why worry? Now, I'm kind of seeing Alfred E. Newman there on the cover of Mad Magazine. What me worry. This is not about being dumb or being thoughtless. It's not about, you know, being imprudent, but it's about these two sides. So on the one side, not worrying about things that don't happen, right? Or that are very unlikely to happen. I want to suggest a couple of things from the neurobiology of the human animal that we are to be aware of, and you can help yourself with this. And I definitely have found this to be helpful for me. Be mindful of the sense of accelerating, speeding up. Sometimes we have to speed up, okay? And sometimes we speed up, not just because it's urgent and there's a problem, but because we're looking for fun. You know, we suddenly jump into something enthusiastically. There's a place for speeding up, but it's kind of a yellow flag. And especially these days, because so much of that quality of accelerating or speeding up has a sense of pressure 
or insistence in it. And you, you can feel these things. You can feel your body speeding up. You can feel a sense of pressure. You can feel a kind of insisting that things be a, a certain way or that other people act a certain way or that certain results are produced in the world. And that is a yellow flag at least, if not an orange or a red one, as a slippery slope to stress and worry. Speeding up, pressure, and insistence. And in terms of the body, when we do that, it immediately moves into activity of the fight, flight, freeze uh, threat response system uh, if, that draws upon both the sympathetic nervous system aspects of you know, fighting or fleeing, and it draws upon the parasympathetic aspects to the extreme of freezing, of feeling immobilized, helpless, the human equivalent of playing dead. So be careful about that quality. And I've, in, I've kind of internalized myself when I'm kind of on my game, real-time mindfulness of that sense of getting a little speedy, of getting a little pressured in my interactions with other people. And as soon as that mindfulness of bell starts ringing, right? The mindfulness alarm that says, okay, dial it back. It's like a yellow light starts blinking on the inner dashboard. Dial it back. Do I really need to speed up right now? Do I really need to rush in this way, right? And especially is that sense of speeding up accompanied with any sense of quote unquote negative emotion, sense of anxiety or irritation, frustration, exasperation, that is trouble, right? So that's the first suggestion, to be mindful of that quality of accelerating, pressuring, insisting, applied to yourself or applied to others. And as we you know, disengage from what's not necessary of that, what's needless, add on, we can back away from that. As we do that, we find that we're, we're able to function, we're able to cope, we're actually able to function and cope at a very high level for a long time. We're all in the marathon right now. This is no longer a sprint. It's gradually sinking in. We are in this, I think of it as like a storm. It was very clear to those with eyes to see that it was heading our way as of late, Dece as of December, let alone early January. And now it's landing in America. Um, and uh, elsewhere throughout the world. And it's gonna be here for a while. And the consequences of it will also be here for a while. That's just the fact of it. So we need to find a pace, a pace we can sustain, whether it's the pace of the morning or the afternoon or the evening of your day, or the pace of a day altogether, or the pace of a week or a month. We're gonna be in this for months and months and months could be a year or two or three before we're really kind of on the other side of this and the many consequences of it uh, for those who remain. So, you know, this is a marathon. We need to find that pace we can sustain. We can still be very effective, right? But we don't need to take on the add-on cost of accelerating, pressuring, and insisting. That's on the one side. Uh, and with that, there is a place for just disengaging from thoughts. We don't have to fight them, but do we need to follow them? Do we need to feed and fuel them? If you find yourself worrying about something that you, know, you can realize in your mind, you know, it'll either happen or it won't. If it doesn't, why worry? If it does, I'll do the best I can. So enough, you know, there's that place. There's no replacement for exercising will inside one's own mind, much as if we were in a temple, just imagine stepping into a beautiful sacred temple of any kind around the world or some kind of sacred ground. And we would exercise mindfulness and willfulness about how we conducted ourselves in that temple. We would be careful about our shoes leaving marks on the floor. We might leave them at the door. We, we wouldn't just casually leave our litter behind. We wouldn't start shouting or yelling. We would, we would feel that no, I, I need to be kind of willful. Well, what kind of mindfulness and willfulness do we exercise inside our inner temples? What respect do we have for the inner temple of our own being, that precious sanctuary? 
There's only one inner temple. There are a lot of temples out in the world. There's only one inner temple inside you. It's that precious. It's that singular. It's that important to take care of. Not to make it more special than the temples inside other people. At some fundamental level, I believe that we all have, at some fundamental level, the same temple or we access the same universal temple. Still, it's a precious temple as we each experience it. And in this way as well, we can be mindful and willful uh, about our impact on the temple of other people. Do we need to interrupt them right now? Do we need to brush aside their concerns right now? Do we need to just drop our stresses, our worries, our irritability, um, our righteousness, our need to be the knower? Do we need to really drop that in their temple right now? You know, like we wouldn't do that. Even for a temple we might visit as a tourist, just a, you know, just some kind of temple or church somewhere around the world we walk in, you know, we just, we'd be more respectful. Well, why not be at least that respectful uh, about the temples, the inner sanctuaries of the people that you care the most about, uh, as well as that respectful of the inner temple ourselves. There's no replacement for mindfulness and willfulness. We could get away with a fair amount of mindlessness and willlessness, right, back in February, but you know, not anymore. So that's on the one side. <clears throat> on the other side, and then I'll kind of move to a close here and then hear what you have to say about this. Uh, so letting go of worrying, letting go of unnecessary anxiety, doing the best you can, developing the habit of calm strength. While on the other side, in terms of doing what we can, I wanna draw your attention to one particular aspect of that that's been really striking to me lately, which is generosity. I've seen people be a lot kinder and more considerate to each other these days. Moving down the street, you can see people making more space between them. Um, people, we've, we've had some work in our home, uh, electrical contractor just finishing some things up. He and his uh, workers is, uh, are just really very respectful and understanding of our concern about, you know, what's happening in our home and what are people touching and things like that. You know, there's a generosity in that. And I find people, uh, as we're engaging physical distancing, you know, disperse the herd to save it. As we disperse the herd to save it, including to save more vulnerable members of our herd, even if the risks to oneself perhaps are relatively low, as we do that, physical distancing, um, people are often reaching out more to each other. Uh, there's a lot of interest in these online kind of programs. I really encourage you to come back next week to this Wednesday meditation, um, things like it. Uh, people are sending more communications to each other in all kinds of ways. I'm calling relatives of mine in North Dakota or Colorado that I've kind of been putting off week after week and now's the time to check in, right? Um, there's a generosity in that. Uh, I'm, I'm watching people be really generous in terms of medical supplies of different kinds or, you know, not getting some kind of surgical grade face mask and instead just getting something that's adequate, let's say, for oneself. There are many, many forms of generosity and most of those are not financial, right? Uh, yeah, there's a place for donating money if you, if you can help someone at all scales, but um, most of the generosity that we offer to each other is intangible or certainly it's not financial. And it really, really, really counts. Um, I think sometimes about you know, the name of our species, Homo sapiens, sometimes called the clever ape. I think you know, in many ways it would be appropriate to call us Homo beneficus, the altruistic ape, the generous ape, because the kind of generosity of uh, uh, and altruism that takes many forms, including simply cooperating with others, is very, very rare in the animal kingdom. Uh, clearly, we are the most altruistic species of all. And it, it's very characteristic for us. We survived in small hunter-gatherer bands for millions of years, actually. Uh, certainly two and a half million years or so in terms of our tool manufacturing hominid ancestors. We survived in small bands in extremely dangerous conditions. 
uh, times when due to natural climate change, for example, 100,000 or so years ago, when the only areas in which humans could survive were these small little, in effect, ecological islands down near South Africa, where there were just 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 adult humans left. We nearly went extinct more than once as a species. And the ancestors who lived through those evolutionary choke points and the ancestors who lived in general and then have now spread throughout the world and even up into space and have walked upon the moon have done so through being generous to each other in lots and lots of ways. Not pathological altruism, not overgiving, uh, but you know, sensible generosity, cooperative altruism with each other. That's really, I think, the hallmark of our species. And that's what we are called more than ever to do and to be these days in these times with the storm upon us. And in the process of this generosity, we can take gladness in that goodness. We can appreciate our own generosity, uh, the generosity of effort, of time, of attention, of sincerity, of acts of thought, word, and deed, of all kinds. Uh, rippling out to affect so many beings. And so anyway, I just wanna invite you to reflect on generosity, the generosity received and the generosity given. Um, and to take, you know, take gladness in your own goodness for that kind of generosity, All right? So worry less, give more in the sense of generosity, you know, the open hand, the hand that releases needless worry and the hand that offers a benefit of all kinds to others. Okay, so would anyone care to share about this or share how you're doing? If you do speak, uh, the way I'll do this is I'll see your hand, I'll move through the, the many, many little thumbnails of people and I'll just call on someone. I do request that when you share, uh, you speak um, succinctly and kind of to the, to the point on the table um, that in mind, who would like to, uh, any, anybody want to comment? Anybody want to say anything? Oh, good. I see Linda. Linda, I'm, oops, I'm unmuting you, Linda. Great. Hello, Linda. Hi. Um, I really appreciated your analogy of the marathon. Um, that's very helpful to me. Um, but where I went into the worry and the fear was when you talked about, and this is not just you, and please, please know that I'm not blaming you, but whenever I read that we're in this for the long haul and they put a timeline on it or you put a timeline on it, somehow that doesn't equate with the marathon part mm. and it sends me right into fear and worry like i can't do this for this long I can't, i'm afraid it's not it's not going to be tolerable and it sends me into that spin so yeah. how do we how do we equate the marathon and yet the timeline that's great i really appreciate that linda so it's not personal um i'm gonna mute you now just for the sake of this uh, well first off i'm really glad that you brought that up because um, as, you know, as a teacher myself, and I think this is true for all of us, it's really helpful to track the difference between intent and impact. So my intent there, I think, sincerely was to be helpful. And yet, understandably, for you, it landed in a certain jarring way, right? To talk about, you know, that this will be in this for a while. And for me, personally, the impact of that statement is actually calming. It kind of gives me a sense of a longer view and it relaxes me that I don't have to stress about it's got to be a certain way in a week. You know, I kind of start lightening up about how it's got to be this weekend when I realize, you know, it's going to be a longer haul. Right. And uh, on the other hand, for a different person, that sense of, whoa, we're going to be in it for a while and the graphs and the charts and so forth should come with a trigger warning because they just land on a different person differently. I think that's really important to take into account that uh, there's just diversity of all kinds and we can not feel that we have to, you know, feel ashamed of ourselves that somehow our well-intended impact on someone else was problematic. Um, well, on the other hand, we can take it into account. And I can tell you, Linda, 
I'm going to take this into account the next time <laughs> I talk this way, you know, which is a good thing, I think. So now then, you know, just finishing what to do about it. And I think this is really, um, uh, you know, it's a general issue, right? Uh, for me, I find that it's helpful to really live in kind of two truths. The truth of the present, right? That we know very well and the truth of the future that extends out about which we do not have absolute certainty. We have certainty about this moment of experience, not abs you know, conceptual certainty, but it is what it is. We feel what it, right? It is what it is. But we're not certain about what's going to happen tomorrow or, or later. And to kind of lighten up about that, right? And to kind of um, live with that. I think about a saying from Tibet, um, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. <sighs> Can't you just sort of feel it? <sighs> take care of the minutes, you know? Uh, whew. Take care of the little things. Most of the big ones will take care of themselves. And so that, that for me is a real comfort to just, I can, hand, I can handle a minute. <laughs> and, and, an hour is hard and a year, I don't know, but the next minute and this one and the next one, okay, I can handle that one. So thank you very much, Linda. All right, anybody else? I'm gonna keep scrolling. If I miss your hand, it's not personal. I'm just gonna see, anybody else wanna comment? Oops. No one? Well, oh good. Betsy, Betsy Levine. Okay, and then Karen. So first Betsy, then Karen. So I'm unmuting you, Betsy. Hello. Hi, thank you. you know, the, the, I was thinking about what you said about... The, Betsy, can you move closer to your microphone? I'm having trouble with my microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. But the closer you are, the better. Thank you. I was thinking about what you said at, at, um, in the first part about the pressure and the pushing. And then I realized, of course, that's how I live much of my life, pushing myself and pushing others. So and yeah. then I thought, well, this is a metaphor, isn't it? This whole storm that we're in, even being in my little house here is a metaphor for my world. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, so what's the lesson in this for me? The lesson is how to do this in the midst of the storm, how not to be pushing all the time. Yeah, it's really good. And to think how, so Betsy, are, are, are you aware of any ways you push yourself? Oh, hmm. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, but it's okay. I, I'm, can you all hear me? Yes? Great, but not you, Betsy. Maybe you muted, maybe you need to turn up the volume. I don't know, maybe there's that, but it's okay. I'll just say this and I'm, I'm gonna mute you, Betsy, and then I'll just comment briefly. Uh, I think often the people we put the most pressure on are ourselves. And so that's the person to really you know, be thoughtful about. Okay, and I saw Karen, right? You had your hand up, here we go. So yeah. Karen. Hi, <laughs> you know, I, I've just been thinking that maybe that there is a small potential um, for uh, this whole crisis to be a, a almost an evolutionary moment, like mm. like for for uh, a possibility of a little bit of global awakening. Mm. No, but it, it's just it just feels um, that it could have that, and that makes me feel very uh, excited about this time. I mean to see that something, something positive could possibly come of it in a big way. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I think that's very true. And uh, I think there are real opportunities to get lessons here. Did I see another hand from Becky? I did. Okay, Becky then Anjid. And by the way, if I mispronounce your name, or if you use a pseudonym, by the way, in Zoom, you can use a different name if you want to protect your personal identity. Uh, so uh, if I mangle the pronunciation, just sorry about that. Okay, Becky, yeah. So, uh, well, two things. You kind of touched on both of them, but I think that, that, that this is a real opportunity to be in the moment because we don't know. We never know, but we think we know. 
yeah. what's going to come down the road. You know, we have expectations about that. And I think that our, our expectations are shifting and, and that's probably a good awakening experience. Um, so just, just that like this, these kinds of experiences and really focusing on being present in the now is, is a great benefit. And there are all kinds of amazing things that are happening from, you know, reconnecting with relatives that we haven't, or friends, um, to uh, people stepping up in new ways like this group, um, you know, becoming a, a remote opportunity. So this, my experience so far has been that even as we are sheltering separately, we are gaining greater access to each other and to services mm -hmm. in a different way in a very in a just in a different way and so and looking for those blessings each moment i think is a is a, a lovely way to get there minute by minute to, mm. to get to the other side of what whenever and whatever that looks like thank you yeah may it be so um Thank you. So Anjit, I'm going to unmute you. Great. You are, I think you have, good. You are unmuted. Good. Okay, great. Yeah, it's Angie D. So maybe I'll clean that oh, up. And put a little oh, dot great. In there. Angie, Angie D. Hi, yes. Hi Angie. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I guess for me, first of all, I, I just, um, I'm a super geek when it comes to neuroscience. And so I just feel like I just, drank everything in from um, what you were saying and, and the ways that you were bringing us through um, this process right down. I, I just, I was really appreciating the beauty of it. And, and just to really, because I work with clients who are incredibly stressed out right now and overwhelmed. And so not only is it helpful for me to stay grounded when working with people, uh, but also to find ways to help them self-soothe. So right down to the pole and the grounding, and, and it's so easy to get caught in our heads and worry about, you know, past, future. So to drop in the body, and I'm really appreciating the different sides, like the right, the left, up, just to become that breathing body. And that whole thing about embodying and drinking that in, I found was so rich. Mm -hmm. So I, I just have a great appreciation for all of what you shared and not only for my own practice, but for ways that I, I might be able to help others. So really feeling grateful for that right now and excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really great. And I thank you, Angie. For me, that's a form of generosity. Yeah. Gratitude is a form of generosity. And, and I appreciate uh, when a, you know, a fellow geek, dork, uh, you know, kind of, he's like, oh yeah, I kind of, <laughs> I don't understand what he's doing there. You know, it's really good. And, um, yeah, that sense of things as a whole is so helpful. Yeah. And I, I kind of want to underline where we got to at the end, that sense of consciousness, yeah. just to not an airy-fairy sense, just this moment of experience, this moment of experience, being, you know, conscious, you are the, the consciousness as a whole that you are. Beautiful. Open, undisturbed, and yeah. vast like the sky. Yeah. That was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. I'm going to mute you. Thank you, Angie. Maybe another person. I'm going to bounce around a little bit and we'll end on. Okay, great. I see Shilpa and then I'm going to keep going. So you're unmuted, Shilpa. Okay. And I'll just repeat for everyone, you know, we're try to speak to the point and keep it kind of short and you know, keep on going. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, you know, recently my son has been having nightmares. And he has been imagining that there is a monster that is going to come and get him. Yeah. And to me, this is, um, you know, I found that, that really that monster is in some ways kind of like our fear of the virus. It's not that it's impossible, that something could threaten his safety in some way, that an intruder could come in, that a bad guy could come and overpower. <sighs> and it's something where he has no control. You know, that's something very real. But, you know, you know, grounding in um, what is real. I mean, not in the sense of in the real right now, in the present moment. Mm -hmm. So putting it together, 
you know, you know, even with him, I've been starting to do the meditation where you do a little bit of a body scan. So you mm. can start to ground in that sensation and recognizing that reality comes from a lot from our sensations, the touch, the sight, the sound. And, you know, a lot of the fear about the virus is, is an abstract thing. It's not that it's not real, but it is abstract. And that, you know, if we can focus on those body sensations and that moment, just like with my son, you know, that you can actually find that this moment, you know, it is that focus again on that present moment. And then still keeping in mind, just, I think that um, I always love and use that analogy. I think there was some, somebody that talked about the peach tree that you've talked about before, that there's, the, you know, you can have the, you can give it good water, give it good light, give it good soil, yeah. but you can't make it give you peaches. So you, you know, you use your masks when you want to, you do social distancing, you keep yourself as safe as you possibly can. You can't control the peaches, but you cannot tell me that the social distancing and the mask wearing and the cleanliness, that it doesn't make a difference on whether or not you actually are safer or yeah. not. So... Well, thank you. And that's really true. And it, it goes to kind of a, a quote that, that I turned into the peach tree, you know, from Ajahn Chah, a great teacher, who says, tend to the causes and be at peace with, but don't be attached to the results, right? Um, I think we have enough time. I'd like to make a brief comment. Um, and then I think we might have time for one more person. So the brief comment is that uh, I want to thank uh, Bill Schwartz, who made a note in the chat, and you can see the chats, who pointed out that, um, you know, you have an opportunity with me and with this group to be generous here too, right? Uh, you can be generous to others in your comments in the chat. Uh, you can be generous to me, which keeps this going. There's a donation basket. Uh, I welcome advice. Uh, <laughs> You know, we all keep improving the sound quality. That's a form of generosity too. And my point about this as a teacher is, is that um, it's really to say, certainly very consistent with the Buddhist tradition, that it's, it's good for your practice to be generous in lots of ways. And if that generosity naturally moves from you to me, I'm very grateful for it. I really appreciate it. But there's no need for it. You know, so you don't need to make a donation, but if you're moved to make a donation, if it makes you feel good, you know, if it feels like it's part of the circle of generosity that we're all part of, to receive, there's a giving, to make room for the giving of others, there's a receiving oneself, you know, that is, is very appreciated by me. And so I just want to mention it from time to time that, you know, if you, if you care to support this Wednesday uh, meditation, uh, you know, that's one way to do it. And there's no need for it. And whatever you do is really gratefully appreciated. Okay, I think we've got, I'm gonna bounce out to some of the farther out tiles. Great, great, great. Anybody else, a last comment or question? Anybody wanna raise their hand? Yeah, no, anybody? Great, anyway, one more, let's see. I see Fran, so Fran, uh, sorry, Rick. I'm just gonna go here with Fran and we'll finish up. So Fran, I'm unmuting you. This button, come button, unmute. There we are, you know, you are unmuted, Fran, finally. Okay, I wanted to um, follow up on Angie's comment about self-soothing and mm. uh, share what I've been working with, thanks to you, a few months ago in San Rafael, and it really resonates about uh, let be, let go, let in the good. So every day, almost before I get out of bed, I try to let be, and um, I don't need to control or fix or even change. This is the way it is right now. And then the uh, let go is not only the worrying and the fear and the anxiety, but the story in my head. Yeah. And then letting in the good, I've been spending a lot of time gardening, and I thought if there has to be a pandemic, let it be in the spring, because there are 10,000 sorrows right now but there's the miracle of, of nature. It's one of your jot cards, the piece of just looking out the window, seeing that there are also joys. And so I just am really loving the let go, let be, let in the good. And I try to do it 
you can't say count to 10. Uh, and <laughs> I'm getting there. So I wanted to thank you for that and share it with the others. And you might want to say even more about it. Thank you. Oh, Rick. oh thank you. That's really kind of you. Um, you know, what, what Fran has done is summarize uh, what I think of as the three great ways to practice, essentially. Let be, let go, let in. You know, we be with what's there. We release what's burdensome or painful or harmful. And we receive what is beneficial, enjoyable, and useful. Let be, let go, let in, right? If, the, if life is like a garden, speaking of gardens, we can witness the garden and be with it while also pulling weeds, letting go, and uh, letting in. Uh, growing flowers. So that's a general uh, way to do it. And um, what I would say is that uh, it also is a way to deal with being upset. There's a natural three-step trajectory. We be with what we're feeling, we experience it, and then we kind of move increasingly into releasing, letting it go, kind of experiencing it out. In effect, we're welcoming it in on the way out the door. <laughs> Let me let go. Let me let go. One word. Let me let go. You know, out the door, releasing. And then we want to replace what we've released with something beneficial, you know, let in. What would be the natural replacement for what we've released or just in general, a sense of calm, or well-being, the peacefulness deep down inside us all, the goodness deep down inside us all. We, we let in. And sometimes that flow, let be, let go, let in occurs over a dozen seconds. Something bothers you, you understand it, you disengage from it, you release it, and you, re and you then establish yourself where you really want to be. You, know, you find your footing in a better way of being as an attitude or a way of conducting oneself or clarifying, you know, reestablishing re your true intentions in a situation, uh, including intentions of not harming yourself or harming others. So that sequence sometimes is a dozen seconds, Sometimes it's a dozen months to really, really move through the whole flow of it sometimes. And sometimes we move through it at a certain level and then we come back to it a little deep, more deeply. And then we come back to it even more deeply after that. So let be, let go, let in. And that seems pretty, pretty appropriate for these days. So I invite us all to just sort of sit with each other for another half minute or so, just kind of being together. You might like to do what I'm doing, um, which is scrolling through. You're just many beautiful faces. And we are just sitting together, letting it sink in. That's great. Truly, I so appreciate all of you.